Today we are privileged to be able to join together in a sacred gift to the church. We call it the Lord's Table or Communion. In some traditions, it's called the Eucharist. And in fact, the name Christmas comes from the tradition where the Eucharist was celebrated in a Mass. And it was Christ's Mass where they would proclaim the miracle of Emmanuel, the incarnation, uh, the birth of Jesus. And so Christ's Mass over time became Christmas. And though we do not call this a Mass, uh, though we do see this as a time of giving thanks, which is what Eucharist means, we call this the Lord's Table or Communion. It's a time where we gather together to remember. Today is the 10th day of Christmas. For those of you who follow the church calendar, this Wednesday's Epiphany, and which will officially close out the Christmas season. And so we still have our Christmas decorations out because we are still in the season of remembering the great gift of what Christ has given us through his life, his death, and his resurrection. In 1939, Dietrich Bonhoeffer explained a critical truth in what was called his Christus Victor address, which simply means Christ as victor. This saint of the church who was martyred at the hands of Adolf Hitler said, in our lives we don't speak readily of victory. It's too big a word for us. We have suffered too many defeats in our lives. Victory has been thwarted again and again by too many weak hours, too many gross sins. But isn't it true that the spirit within us yearns for this word, for the final victory over sin and anxious fear of death in our lives? And now God's word also says nothing to us about our victory. Hang in there. I want you to hear this. Don't judge it yet. It doesn't promise us that we will be victorious over sin and death from now on. Rather, it says with all its might that someone has won the victory and that this person, if we have him as our Lord, we will also win the victory over us. It is not we who are victorious, but Jesus. And I want you to realize before we take communion this morning that that is the key to understanding the promises of God and the victory we have. The Bible teaches us that the victory we have is a vicarious victory. The victory that we have is a vicarious victory, which means that it's a victory that we partake of. It's a victory that we share. It's a victory that's been given to us. It's not by our works. It's not by our merits. The victory that we have in Jesus Christ and the victory that we remember every time we come to this table is that the victory is all grace. The victory is all gift. And so we come to this table because we have been invited by grace. We come to this table because upon the cross of Jesus Christ, Jesus declared it is finished. That the victory that he won for us through his vicarious death was an atoning sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins and that when we put our faith in the victory of Jesus Christ, then our sins are forgiven. And we are filled with the Holy Spirit who is the presence of the triune God in us. This is the victory we celebrate. Paul taught us these words from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 28. The church throughout history has called these the words of institution. The words that we are to read and to remember as we celebrate the Lord's victory, given to us, not because we deserve it, but because he earned it for us. Hear these words. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us now take the communion element of the bread, in this case, a little wafer that's at the top of your cup. 
Let us lift up that wafer and remember that what this symbolizes is that this is the body of Christ broken for you for the victory of your forgiveness of sin. Christ Jesus, His body broken for you. Let us remember. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace that has found us worthy to partake of your broken body. We thank you for your grace that has entered us through faith in Jesus Christ, for it is by grace that we have faith, and it's through grace we sustain faith. And Lord, thank you that we can partake of grace. The word of God continues. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And I encourage you to lift up your cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come. Partake. His blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. The new covenant. Lord Jesus, bless and keep your church. Lord Jesus, turn your face toward your people and be gracious to them. Lord Jesus, lift your countenance upon your people and give them peace. Bless your church. They have partaken of your body. They have drunk of the cup. They have partaken of this ordinance of the church to remember that when we partake of Christ, we partake of his victory. And that eternal life is found in the victory of Jesus Christ. Receive grace, people of God. Be strengthened, people of God. Be healed of your infirmities, people of God, be forgiven of your iniquities. Christ is our healer. Christ is our victory. Now may the Lord protect you and may he be your peace as you have taken him into your life. And all of God's people said, amen. It is done. It is done. Please watch this video.
That is the introduction to our new sermon series that we're kicking off for 2021. Uh, we have been preparing as the elders of the church for quite a long time uh, to, to be teaching about the promises of God. And I'm just so excited for this series. I believe it's providential, which means it's God's timing, because with all the things going on out there right now, the church, uh, we need to hang on to the promises of God and we need to live a victorious life. And so we're going to be talking about that today. Today is kind of like the kickoff, the framework sermon for how we're going to be walking through the promises the rest of the year. And you just saw the theme verse, which is 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 4. But now I want to read to you uh, that verse in context, which means I'm going to read the first three verses before it, okay? Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And this is God's word. This is going to be our theme scripture for as long as it takes because God has given us so many good promises. And really, these are the fundamentals of the Christian faith. These are the fundamentals of what it means to walk faithfully with God, to walk victoriously with God, because God wants us to have more than a sufficient faith. He wants us to have a faith that perseveres, that endures, that finishes the race well, okay? And so we're gonna be looking at that today. So here we go, God's word, uh, the theme scripture for this year. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything. Oh, I love words like that. He has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Praise Jesus. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. Oh, so that, pay attention to so that, okay? Why did he give us his precious and magnificent promises? So that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Oh, Lord Jesus your precious and magnificent promises are ours because of your victory on the cross, because of your indwelling us with your Holy Spirit. You have given us the victory. Now help us to live like it. Teach us now to the power of your Holy Spirit. Teach us. Oh Lord, use me. May the meditations of my heart and may the words that come from these lips be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Empty me of anything that is of me and only speak that which is of you. Your word, may your word, which is eternal and everlasting, go forth and not return void. Come, Lord Jesus, habitate with your people. Emmanuel, we invite you. We ask you, we humbly ask you may you increase and may we decrease amen amen so today's sermon is a big picture overview of how we're going to go through every promise of God now we can't go through all of them we'd be here for years <laughs> and maybe we will uh, maybe that's what the elders of the church will decide is how my teaching ministry should continue for a while maybe we need to go through every promise of God <laughs> maybe that's what we need um, but I want you to know that there are four big ideas uh, that are going to flow throughout this. So today, I'm gonna to give you an overview of the promises, and then we're gonna look at those four big ideas that are gonna weave through every promise of God that we're gonna learn. And I want you to pay attention because I'm not gonna be able to do this every week. And, and a lot of Sundays coming up, I'm gonna say, hey, if you weren't here on January 3rd, go back and listen to that service online. So for those people who are listening now or are here, 
you've got it. And if you need to be reminded of these things, I'm gonna, you can go back and listen to this sermon again. You can also read the whole manuscript, which is on our blog, on our webpage. Thank you to Mr. Kennard for putting my manuscripts up on the blog. Also, every daily phone call, by the way, if you didn't know this, every daily phone call you get from myself or Pastor Ken, those manuscripts are on our blog. And also, we put them on YouTube. We make YouTube videos of all those daily devotional calls that you get. And if you're not getting those, please fill out a, call, a card and uh, give us your phone number, your email, if you want to start getting daily devotional calls from our church. They're less than two minutes long, and they're there to encourage you. Um, now, let's look at this. Let's look at the overview. God is inviting us, his church, to live the victory that Jesus Christ has won for us. We are invited by God to live like champions. Now, the Bible says we're more than conquerors. We don't walk around in our everyday lives as American Christians saying, conquer. That that's kind of seems very militaristic, right? So champion is a word that seems to resonate more with the American spirit, and I just want to use that word so you know. I'm getting it from more than conquerors, but we're using the concept of champion because, you know, a lot of us love sports, and that will help us connect with the idea. Now, we're going to talk about what that, that looks like in a little bit. I want you to hear an overview truth about the promises of God from Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. Okay, so God's word from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 to 22 says this. For as many as are the promises of God, in him, we're talking about Jesus here, in Jesus they are yes. Therefore, okay, always pay attention to therefores. <laughs> because all the promises of God are yes in Jesus, therefore, also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Amen means so be it. I'm in agreement. And what that's saying basically is because Christ has given us all the promises of God, we then are to be in agreement with them and that those promises live in us and through us. The word continues, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us in God, excuse me, now he who has established us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a pledge, as a guarantee, as a security. So we see the work of the Trinity. We see the work of God through the promises of God. You hear this same truth from Peter. So we just read Paul from 2 Corinthians, and our theme verse covers these same truths. Your faith is not of yourself. That is so important for you to realize. You have a received faith. Your faith has been given to you. It's a received faith. It's not a created one. It's a gift from God. It's one that is bestowed upon you. And you have a received faith that is the same as Paul's. The same as is Peter's. How? Faith comes through the righteousness of of our God through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's what we're being taught in our scripture. Grace and peace are multiplied through you. Excuse me. Grace and peace are multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and Jesus, our Lord. That's how grace comes to you, through the knowledge of God that is given to you through the work of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Bible says that you have been granted everything pertaining to life and godliness through whose power? What's the scripture say? His divine power. You have everything you need through the work of Christ, through the indwelling of the Spirit, because God has ordained it to be such. 
You do not have a faith of your own. You have a received faith. Just like you don't have a victory of your own, you have a vicarious victory. You are indwelt. You are given. You are big fancy words like imputed. You have that which has been graced or given to you. This is all gift. Are you hearing this? Do you understand the victory that is yours? Peter made it very clear from the very beginning, God has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. They're all grace. You don't have to earn them. You don't have to earn them. It's good news. It's grace. And why? Why has God given us his grace through his son, Jesus Christ? And Peter continues, he explains this, so that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature. Next week, we're gonna go deep on what that means. Having escaped the corruption, which means death, that is caused, that is in the world by lust. God has given you victory through his precious and magnificent promises, and that victory is yours through your fellowship with God. And the way you have fellowship with God is by joining in the fellowship with Jesus. And the way you join with the fellowship with Jesus is by the fellowship of the Spirit who dwells in you. You are alive in Christ. You've heard that? I'm alive in Christ. How are you alive in Christ? Because Jesus took your death upon himself. And then how did he give you life? See, Jesus takes your death and then the Father and Son fill you with the Spirit. And the Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And when God dwells in you, you're alive. You're no longer dead. You're no longer under wrath. The Bible says in Romans 8, 1, therefore now there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Amen? Because you're sharing, you're partaking of his divine nature. And you cannot partake of his divine nature if you're a child of wrath. You're no longer a, a, a vessel for wrath. You're now a vessel for glory because God has made you new. And that's what we talked about last week. God is calling you. God is inviting you. God is saying, now partake in my divine nature, which means live like champions. Live like you believe it. Live like the victory is yours already because it is. The victory is already yours. The Super Bowl ring is already guaranteed for you. All you gotta do is show up. He's gonna play the game through. He's gonna do the work through you. Listen to some of these truths. Listen to some of the truths about the inheritance that you have because whenever you hear the Bible talk about you being an heir of God or receiving the inheritance or no longer being a slave of fear but now being a child of God or talking about your sonship, it's talking about this. Listen to Galatians chapter four, verses four to seven. We went over this verse like every week during Advent. Galatians four, uh, verses four to seven. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law. To redeem something, to take it back, to bring it back to its original value. That we might receive what? The adoption as sons. Ladies, this applies to you. Remember, sonship is about your right of inheritance, not about your gender. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba. <laughs> crying, Father. Why? Because you're no longer cut off or estranged from God. You're no longer at enmity or strife with God because of sin, because of the corruption of the world by lust. You are now separated from that and you're now given his spirit and you can talk to God like he's your father. A good father. A good daddy. May the Lord heal those with father wounds so that they may see God as a good father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, amen, but you are a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And what's an heir? Someone who has all the, vic all the victory, all the promises of God. 
has the indwelling presence of God, has eternal fellowship with God, has security in the work of God through the pledge of the Holy Spirit put in you. Bam! It's powerful. You can live your life differently if you believe this. And you know what? If you don't believe it yet, that's okay because guess what? It's not your job to believe because it's a received faith, not a made up one. If you don't yet believe, don't worry, you will because it's a gift from God. It's a gift. Just believe. Surrender, submit to this truth that will set you free from a life of anxious toil. Say, God, I don't yet quite fully understand it, but I believe because it's a gift from you. And just like that wonderful Christmas present that you didn't leave under your tree because you wanted to open it, this is the most beautiful present. Now open it and receive. Become a partaker of his divine nature. Receive the victory that has already been won for you on the cross, that's given to you by grace. It's a gift. You are an heir to all the promises of God. And that is our amen to the glory of God. That is what we say amen to. We believe it. We're aligned with it. We're going to do it. You will be his people and he will be your God. <sighs> because he doesn't forsake his own. Paul proclaims this in Ephesians chapter 2. One of the best scriptures to use for evangelistic crusades. <laughs> this is what I go to every time when I'm asked to kind of do like that kind of work. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm just going to read the second half of this beautiful thing, but I want you to listen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 starts with the, most two, the two most powerful words in Scripture. Does anybody know the two most powerful words in Scripture? But God. Ah! COVID, but God. Cancer, but God. Divorce, but God. Depression, but God. But God is the most powerful couplet of words in the Scripture. Rebellious child, but God. Rebellious parent, but God. <laughs> but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Paul, thank you for these words. Holy Spirit, thank you for giving Paul these words to give to us. Because of whose great love? Remember that love is not that you love God, but that he loved you. That's salvation. Because your faith is a gift. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, transgressions is a word for sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Grace, gift, the power of a gift. And raised us up with him. Hear this, listen to this. This has already happened. Mystery of God, but it's true. Just because your mind can't comprehend it, because mind struggles to comprehend it, doesn't mean it's not true. Remember, our faith is not one we make up, but one we receive. The truths of God are true. The promises of God are true. Even when our current events don't always seem to align with them. That's why we gotta live with this perspective, live with this priority, that this is more truer than anything we know that's true in this world. And here's the truth. Listen to God's word. For those who are in Christ Jesus, he has raised us up with him, and seated us, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, already done. <laughs> Don't get that, but I believe it. And it causes me to live differently. So that, why is the so that there? So that in the ages to come, God might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God <laughs> not as a result of work so that no one may boast and here's how Paul ends this and don't hear this as separate okay listen for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it's the gift of God not as a result of works so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship creating Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them you are not saved by works but you're saved for works you are saved through faith alone, but faith never stands alone. Because when you have received the victory, you're supposed to walk in the victory. When you've received 
the promise of the championship ring, you're supposed to play like a champion. You're not JV anymore. You've been promoted to varsity. You're not on the freshman team anymore. You're playing on Friday night under the lights. You've been called up. You've been drafted. You're now in the NFL. And you may not feel like you be, you, you're supposed to be there. But you've been chosen to be there. You've been handpicked to be there. Play like you believe it. Because the victory is yours. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at these four big points because we are going to learn over this next year or however long it's going to take us, we are going to learn how to live like champions through this imagery of being a part of a Super Bowl winning team. For an NFL team to win the Super Bowl, every player has to play like a champion. You saw this in the video. There's four things that every player has to do. Each player must do the following. First, here it is, ready? You gotta know the team's playbook. If you're part of an NFL team, you better know the team's playbook, right? Second thing, you gotta train to be in great shape. You're a part of the team now. We've got to train. Grace is never opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. You don't have to earn your spot on your team, but now that you have the spot, you're to train. And that takes effort. Third, you're supposed to listen to the coach. <laughs> you're part of the team. And who calls the shots? The coach. And fourth, you're not alone. You're a part of a team now. Work together with your teammates. Those are the four points that we're gonna focus on of what it means to be a part of a Super Bowl winning team. In the same way, as we learn the precious and magnificent promises of God so that we may become partakers of the divine nature to the glory of God, we must also do these same four things. And I'm quickly gonna go through each of those to give you an overview. What's the first thing we're supposed to do so that we live like champions, so that we are walking as partakers of his divine nature to his glory. Here's the first thing. We are God's team, and we need to know God's playbook. We need to know what the promises of God are. God has given us everything we need. That's a promise. God has given you everything you need for godliness and for life, for his glory. Paul exhorts us through his disciple Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. This is a verse worth memorizing, by the way. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the athlete of God says the person of God but I'm going to say the, so that the athlete of God may be adequate equipped for every good work how are you to be equipped for every good work how are you to be trained in righteousness how are you to remain humble through God's reproof and correction of you how are you to learn it's through his word God has given us his word. He's given us everything. Do you know the promises of God? This Bible from cover to cover is the promise of God. It's his love letter to you. Do you know his word? Do you know the promises? Well, that's what we're gonna be learning. One Sunday at a time, and I invite you to join us. Prioritize this time. Whether you can be here in person or online, prioritize listening and learning because it will change your life because we'll start living according to who we are in Christ Jesus. Psalm 119. Whoa, what a great place to start. If we had all day, I'd read you the whole psalm. It's a long one. But listen to one verse, verse 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. So how do we walk? How are we to walk faithfully as a member of this team? 
like any good player, we need to memorize the playbook. We need to know the playbook. We need to hide it in our heart so that we live according to the coach's plan. Second thing we need to do, as God's players, as his athletes, we need to exercise our faith. It's not enough. Okay, let me say that. Let me say this right. For a long time in the church, I believe that we have been satisfied with a sufficient faith. We have rested on the fact that, yes, I am saved because I believe in Jesus, and now I can sit back and I can just wait until he takes me home to heaven, and that's all he asks of me. But then we don't live with peace, and we don't live with joy, and we're still at odds with each other, and we fight over the color of the carpet, and we get all messed up when there's financial issues, and blah, blah, blah. It's because we're dual-minded and weak in our faith. God says, be strong in the faith. Don't be double-minded. Don't let worldly circumstances like COVID or presidential elections or financial issues or diagnoses cause you to jump off the victorious winning team. Those things are gonna happen. But the way you live victoriously is by looking at those events through his word and then saying, Lord, train me in righteousness. Train me so that I can continue to live with faith, hope, and love no matter what the scoreboard says because the, the greatest lie in our world is the scoreboard because he's already won. You know the most useless sports statistic is the score at halftime, right? Everything that's going on right now is halftime scoreboard issues. Don't get caught up in it. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's painful. Yes, we're grieving. I'll be doing my brother's. uh, Kevin, his mom passed away this week. I love you, brother. I'm, I'm grieving with you. I'm doing the service for his mom tomorrow. But you know what Kevin asked me to do tomorrow? He said, proclaim the gospel. Proclaim that there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Tell him about grace. Because his mom knew about the victory and she lived it. And so when we meet tomorrow, yes, there'll be tears. Yes, there'll be grieving. But you know what we'll be doing? We'll be reminding everywhere, everyone in that room, in Hinsey Brown, we'll be reminding them about the victory we have in Jesus and about the grace of God. Because that's our victory. Even when we face death all day long, even when we're like sheep to be slaughtered, we know that we have a living hope in Jesus Christ. But do we live that way, friends? And that's why the world doesn't believe our story. It's because we're not. And that's not pressure on us. That's an invitation. It's an invitation that the world may believe the gospel because they see the gospel alive in our lives. This is the greatest evangelistic witness we can have that we're people of peace and we're people at rest in the midst of all the division and all the brokenness and all the chaos that is our nation and our world. We can be different because we're citizens of heaven and we remember that and we don't have just a sufficient faith that makes us feel good about going to heaven one day, but we have a persevering faith because we're trained in righteousness. It gives us a different perspective. It gives us a different priority to how we live our lives. This is what it means to train ourselves for godliness. This is what it means to become partakers of the divine nature. That we would be in the yoke of Jesus. That we would be abiding in the vine. That we would be carrying our cross. This is what it means to be disciples and followers of the one who has already given us the victory. The victory is through his shed blood on the cross. 1 Timothy chapter 4. That's enough of me talking. Let's hear God's word. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. Listen to Paul teach us this. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. As it holds promise, hear the word? As it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Are you in spiritual training? Now once again, grace is opposed to earning. We are not talking about works here. I'm not saying that you do anything to earn the approval of God. Please do not hear that. Spiritual training is not about earning. But grace is not opposed to effort. 
Grace is not opposed to us learning as members of this Super Bowl winning team how to take the promises of God and memorize them, hide them in our heart, and then train our neural pathways and our autonomic nervous system and and our hormones so that when we're in a situation, we know how to be in the right position at the right time. We know to run the right pattern to catch the ball instead of looking at the big Tim Martin 300 pound guy right in front of us going, oh my goodness, and start freaking out because this guy's gonna crush me and kill me because he's so big and you know, because he played amateur ball, almost NFL ball, but amateur ball, and, and he knows what it takes to be at that level. Me, I'd be shaking. Sometimes when he gives me a hug, it's like seeing a chiropractor. But the thing is, if we don't train ourselves in righteousness, then we let our emotions, right? We let our hormones, we let our chemistry take over instead of letting the promises of God and the Spirit of God govern over us. Remember the Bible says, may the peace of God control you, may the love of Christ compel you, may the peace of God guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible's talking about over and over and over again. The good news is that when we train ourselves in godliness, the fullness of the victory of God is always before us because every athlete in a sports team has a glory day that's behind them. Every athlete will get to a point in their life where the glory is behind them and all they have are memories of glory, right? Remember the day back in high school when I caught that and we won the states? Always going back to the glory days. But you know, when you're training yourself in righteousness, here's the good news. It's not about winning the state championships 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It's about the championship that's still in front of us. The glory days are always in front of us. We're never living in the past. We're forgetting what is behind us. We're straining towards what is ahead. And the only way we can stay future focused and hopeful is when we're training ourselves in righteousness according to the promises of God. Otherwise, we default back to thinking about the glory days that are behind us, about when life was better in this body. Well, you know, the Bible says, pitied are the people who dwell upon this life alone. Our glory days are ahead of us, no matter what this body's telling you, no matter what the doctor told you, no matter what your bank account said. No matter how the world defines success, if you are a believer in the promises of God, your glory days are always ahead of you. So be of good cheer. Do not grow weary in doing good. Stand firm. Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Listen to this. This athlete imagery is in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the game exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. The Super Bowl ring that I am putting before you today is not like some ring that, will, that can burn, that can, that can be gone. What God offers you is imperishable. It will never dissolve. It will never go away. It is eternal. It's him. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I stay focused. I, I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline. Do you hear this? Church, for those of you who have been lied to, that you think grace is opposed to effort, read the scriptures again. Grace is opposed to earning that you can earn anything from God. But being a Christian does not mean you can sit back on your laurels and just say that Christ has done it all and I can do nothing. Yes, you're saved by faith alone, but your faith never stands alone. It's all grace. Now let the grace work in you because listen to what Paul said. Paul says, therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not being there, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. And that leads us to the third big idea. We are God's players. We're God's athletes, and now we need to listen to God the coach. God is the coach. It's his voice who will call the plays. If we're gonna run the right play at the right time, then we need to learn to listen 
to his voice. And that takes discipline of your body. Huh. How many people here sometimes let their emotions or their hormones or whatever it may be get the best of them and they whoosh, gone. Off on some path. Well, I did my morning devotion time this morning, but I don't know why I'm now running this way and doing this. It's because God, God wants to be constantly on your mind. A constant partaking of his divine nature. Jesus says it this way, but he who enters by the door is a shepherd. When you hear the word shepherd, hear the word coach because it's the person in authority. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep, coach, athletes. Shepherd, coach, sheep, athletes. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls them his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is the coach. Jesus is the good shepherd. It, he is the one in authority over our lives. And one of the most challenging parts of the Christian life is learning to submit yourself to the authority of Jesus. And that doesn't just mean, mean submit some of the time. It means how do we learn to submit even our good ideas to him so that we run the right play at the right time. Because you know, what if you're on an NFL team and you're in the Super Bowl and you as some wide receiver has some great idea of how you're gonna win the game and you run your own play, but the rest of the guys are running the play that the coach called. You may be a star player, but if you run your own play, what does that do to the whole team? We're gonna watch some guy running out here There are no lone rangers. We are always submitted to the coach. And we are always called to run the play as a team. That's the way to victory. And that takes us to our last point. And before I give you that last point, I want to do this one thing. I want to tell you this. The promises of the victory and the promises of the abundant life are not what you think they are. Because our culture has taught us a health and wealth and prosperity gospel that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The abundant life is your fellowship in the Trinity. The indwelling of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in you through the Spirit's presence, through the atoning sacrifice, the vicarious sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through the choosing of the Father of this way to Him. So let's be clear. The victory that I am calling us to live and the championship that I am calling us to win. So the, the, you're calling to live in a way of a champion. You're calling to win this victory is not always going to be your health or your wealth. It's not always going to be your worldly success or your prosperity in the eyes of other people who are judging you. That is not the gospel I preach, and that is not the gospel that we have received from Jesus Christ. We need to be clear about that, otherwise we will be distorted from the first day in, in how we think about the promises of God because we'll think about them as individuals and how they can benefit me. We are part of a team. We're part of a family that has been called to play the handbook that God has given us for his victory that's already been won. Now, with that understood, <laughs> that the abundant life that God promises us is the fullness of his presence, which is love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and gentleness and kindness and faithfulness and self-control that the fullness of his presence guards our hearts and minds and gives us the strength to live another day no matter what's going on doesn't mean it's going to fix the situation it means that his presence is going to be with us in the midst of that so we can play the game his way and not get pulled off course that leads us to our fourth point that we are god's team and that this is God's victory. 
The championship celebration is in our future. And we're invited to live like we believe that. We're invited to play like champions today, knowing the victory is already ours in Christ Jesus and that we may not fully experience it until it's fully realized, but it's ours. Paul explains this to us, explains this to us in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 to 39. And this is the last scripture because we're about to wrap it up. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. Did you hear it? We are champions. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing, which includes you, by the way. Any other created thing includes you. (laughs) People forget that all the time. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from the Super Bowl ring that you have been promised and drafted to be a part of. Now play with that promise in mind. Nothing can thwart the plan of God, including you. Play with that faith. Don't live in condemnation and shame when you sin and make mistakes. Repent and get back on board. The longer you wallow running your own plays, the more harmful it is to the reality that you can live a victorious life. It won't thwart God's plan, but it will cause you to feel isolated and separated from the plan of God. God doesn't want that for you. He wants you to know that he's won this victory for you. He wants you to trust him that you have these promises, that you can live according to these promises, that you can trust his voice, and that he wants you to play this team. He wants you to play on this team as part of the team and trust him. So my question to you is, do you trust God? Do you live like God's victory is secure for you as a member of his body? For he is the head and we are the body. And so I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up here. And we're going to proclaim a song that we are no longer slaves of fear for we have been made children of God. That no matter the song proclaims truths that even when it looks like there's an impossible obstacle in front of us, God is going to part the way. Because when you're on God's team, he will make a way to the victory. We just got to hang on to that. We got to remember that. And I invite you on this journey in 2021 that no matter what may come, no matter what the circumstances of our nation or of COVID or of your health or your loved one's health, no matter what may come, that God is good and that God is powerful and that God has the victory in mind and he wants you to be a part of his championship team. He wants you to partake of his divine nature. Jesus is our victory. He has given us all the precious and magnificent promises of God. He's given us everything we need to live the victorious life. And so now may the Lord bless you and may the Lord fill you with these truths so that you may not live as a slave to fear, but may you live as an heir of the promises, as a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.